Well, hey there, friends. This is Brother Lorne. Uh, this is part of our ongoing conversation we're having about what's going on in the United Methodist Church. Today, I thought we'd talk about that most commonly asked question I get. Uh, more than just about anything else, uh, when I talk with so many of you, uh, the question I am most commonly asked is simply, why are traditionalists the ones leaving? I mean, if in fact the 2019 special called General Conference uh, affirmed uh, the strongest, most traditional, even most biblical book of discipline we've ever had, and if traditionalists in general agree with what was passed and support it and really want to live by it, uh, then why are traditionalists the ones who are leaving? Uh, because it seems odd that those who are supporting the Book of Discipline and simply want to keep it and abide by it, that they'd be the ones talking about leaving. Uh, one would think it would be the progressives. So why aren't the progressives the ones leaving? Why isn't it the group of people that disagree with the Book of Discipline, don't like what it says, and really would like to change it and don't want to live by it? Why aren't they the ones leaving? Why is it traditionalists they're even thinking about leaving the United Methodist Church. You know, it's the question I get asked all the time these days. And you know, it's a good question. And it's an important one. Because really, if you think about it, it gets to the very heart of what's going on in our United Methodist Church right now. And it's really at the very core of why the United Methodist Church is really splitting. Uh, so it's important to kind of take a few moments to think about it. Why are traditionalists leaving the United Methodist Church? Well, there are a couple of different parts of that. Uh, one of the things going on is that the progressives have made it very clear they're not leaving. Uh, you know, one of the uh, things that came out of the 2019 General Conference is no sooner had it concluded uh, than many of the progressive leaders, uh, people who are representative of the different lobbies and caucuses, uh, for the United Methodist Church, uh, progressive leaders from things like the Reconciling Ministries Network, they came out and said very loudly and clearly, we're not leaving. We're not going to go. We're going to stay and fight to make the United Methodist Church a fully inclusive, fully LGBTQ friendly church. Uh, and it, it doesn't matter to them uh, that there are any number of other denominations they're already that brand of fully inclusive. You know, you'd think they'd readily and eagerly want to go to places like uh, the Episcopal Church, uh, or to go to the Presbyterian USA, or maybe the United Church of Christ, the UCC, or the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. I mean, really, if you go down the list, there's something like a half dozen mainline denominations who've already gone down this path, and they're already fully inclusive the way that these United Methodists want the United Methodist Church to be. Well, why don't they just go ahead and go and do that? Uh, why don't they join one of those denominations? But they've told us very clearly they're not interested in that. Uh, they're not going to go to one of those denominations. They're going to stay and fight to make the United Methodist Church fully LGBTQ inclusive as they envision it. Uh, and why? Well, what they tell us is, it's a matter of justice. Now I'm going to take them at their word for that because it's what they say. But I want you to hear what that means. What they mean by that is it's a matter of right. It's a matter of absolute right versus wrong. Now my progressive friends I have don't have many absolutes I've found. Uh, they're very subjective on any number of things. Uh, truth is so often contextual, I think is the word they like for it. But this is one of those places where they believe in absolute truth. Uh, this is absolute right versus wrong. They believe that it's not just a matter that there is a denomination or church that's fully inclusive and to which all uh, gay, lesbian, transgender, and other such can go to and be fully accepted and approved. But rather, they want every denomination, every church. In fact, they want every congregation and every pastor in the United States to be able to not only accept 
the LGBTQ community, but to affirm them, to approve of them, even dare we say, applaud them. Uh, to say that their life is normal, that it's normative to have these kind of perspectives and live this kind of life. Uh, they want every church, every congregation, every pastor to be fully inclusive in that way. And they're not going to stop at anything short of that. And so they want the United Methodist Church to be that kind of church. And they've made it very clear they're not going. They're not going to leave. They're going to stay and fight no matter how long it takes, no matter what the cost, no matter what has to be done to do it. They are fully committed to that. So that's important. That's one of the things. The second thing that comes along the way is uh, not only are the, the progressives not leaving, what we've come to find out over the last several years, uh, if we didn't already know it, is that most of our bishops in the United Methodist Church are either outright progressive or they, they're very sympathetic to the progressive cause. That is, we do have bishops that are absolutely progressive and they agree with everything that the progressive group has been saying. But then there are other bishops that would call themselves centrist, or even what I might call institutionalist. Uh, that is, they're bishops that they're just, I'm for the United Methodist Church. I'm for whatever keeps us together as the United Methodist Church. They're the ones who like that BUMC. Let's just be UMC. Let's stay UMC. I'm for whatever it takes to keep all parts together. Uh, conservative and liberal together in a unified United Methodist Church, institutionalist, and for the institution of the United Methodist Church. Generally speaking, most of the centrist and institutionalist bishops, while some lean a little uh, traditional, most of them lean very much progressive. And so the majority of our bishops, the number is always hard to tell exactly, but the vast majority of them seem to be either outright progressive or deeply sympathetic to the progressive cause. So that functionally, something else has happened. It's the third piece. Uh, most of our bishops have decided they're not going to enforce the Book of Discipline. Either that or some of them have decided they're just going to outright ignore and uh, uh, defy the Book of Discipline. Now, this is one of the outcomes that's come out of 2019. No sooner did we conclude that 2019 special called General Conference, which again, reaffirmed the traditional view of marriage and human sexuality, which reaffirmed yet again after 50 years, every four years, we have reaffirmed our understanding of the practice of homosexuality. The United Methodist Church does not ordain active practicing self-avowed homosexuals. Uh, nor do we allow pastors to preside over same-sex weddings, nor do we allow churches to host same-sex weddings. Uh, that is the traditional teaching of the church, and it is currently the Book of Discipline. But no sooner did that 2019 General Conference conclude than we had any number of bishops and leaders of annual conferences come out and say, uh, we're simply not going to keep those rules. Uh, it's nice that you passed them. We're not going to do that. We're going to do something else. Uh, and so they decided to ignore those rules and to enforce different rules. Even in fact, uh, at some point, uh, they decided to uh, go a whole other direction uh, and to uh, apply a whole different set of rules uh, that the Book of Discipline didn't have. Uh, now, all of this uh, disobeying the Book of Discipline actually started years earlier. Uh, before the 2019 General Conference. Uh, now, we won't go all the way back to when some of this disobedience began, but I do want to take you back to one of the more significant ones, back into 2016. Right after the 2016 General Conference concluded, uh, we had jurisdictional conferences. Uh, if you remember how the United Methodist Church works, every four years, traditionally, up until recently, we've had a General Conference. And after that general conference, uh, you usually have jurisdictional conferences. Jurisdictions are our regional gatherings where we elect bishops. And so we're the southeastern jurisdiction. 
uh, Texas and Oklahoma are the South Central. There are others in it, but they're the South Central. Uh, and so you have all these different areas, California, Oregon, Washington, Nevada, Colorado. Those are the Western jurisdiction. We have these jurisdictions. Usually in May is the General Conference. And then you go off into July, and we have our jurisdictional conferences. And so in the 2016 uh, jurisdictional conference, each jurisdiction started to elect new bishops. Well, that year, the Western jurisdiction needed to elect a couple of bishops. And one of the bishops they elected uh, was Bishop, uh, well, she was pastor at the time, Karen Oliveto. Uh, she was a pastor of Glide Memorial United Methodist Church at the time over in uh, San Francisco, California. Uh, and uh, as you can see from her bio that I'm really just taking, uh, this is a snippet taken uh, from her annual conferences uh, page, uh, her bio about her. Uh, you can see she's an open practicing uh, lesbian. Uh, how do we know she's an open practicing lesbian? Uh, because she's currently married to another woman, uh, who is also, by the way, a deaconess in the United Methodist Church. Uh, now, note that. She was an ordained elder in the United Methodist Church, uh, and yet she was an open practicing homosexual, a lesbian who's married to another woman. Uh, by the state law of California at the time, uh, now the, the law of the United States of America. Uh, we hadn't had the Obergefell decision just yet at the time that they got married. Uh, but when they elected her as bishop, the delegates to the Western jurisdiction knew full well that she was an open practicing lesbian. And they elected her very much on purpose as a signal to all the rest of the United Methodist Church of where they were taking the United Methodist Church. They had already been ordaining open practicing homosexuals for years, even decades, we think. Uh, but they took the next step of saying, we're going to start to elect and consecrate open practicing homosexuals as bishop. Uh, and in a sense, it was a shot heard around the world uh, because it reverberated through the United Methodist Church. Now, this is one of those things that we say, the United Methodist Church is connectional. It means we're all interconnected. So that what happens in California or in the Western jurisdiction, it doesn't stay there. It affects all of the church. So what happens in California doesn't stay in California. What happens in California affects us here in Mississippi. Uh, and that's what happened. Uh, when they elected her, it sent reverberations throughout the connection of the United Methodist Church. So almost immediately, uh, the South Central jurisdiction was still meeting. Southeastern jurisdiction, our jurisdiction had already concluded uh, their meetings had wrapped up and our delegates had headed home. But South Central was still meeting at the time, and one of their delegates uh, went up to a microphone, and as part of their jurisdiction, uh, they appealed this election. They appealed it to the Judicial Council for review. Now remember, our Judicial Council is the United Methodist Church equivalent of the Supreme Court. And so in due time, uh, in early 2017, the Judicial Council got together and they reviewed the case of her election. And they agreed uh, that uh, her election was uh, a violation of the Book of Discipline. That technically, she should not have been eligible to be elected as a bishop because she was a self-avowed, open, practicing homosexual. And again, their reasoning was, how do we know she's self-avowed and open and practicing? Because she's married to another woman. And if a woman is married to another woman by the laws of the United States, you are self-avowed and open and practicing. And so technically, she shouldn't have been an ordained elder, and she should not have been eligible to be elected as bishop. However, they also said they do not have the power and authority as a judicial council to immediately remove her from office. They can rule what's law by the church, but it doesn't fit with church teaching and law but they don't have the actual power to remove her. So they sent it back to the processes of the appropriate way things are supposed to be done. They sent it back to the Western jurisdiction for them to follow the rules of the Book of Discipline and to enforce the church law. Uh, and so they sent it back to be dealt with by the Western jurisdiction's uh, Episcopacy Committee and the Western jurisdiction's College of Bishops. That was 2017. She was elected in 2016. Uh, that was done in 2017. Uh, this is 2022. Uh, 
Or how many years later? And she's still a bishop. They haven't even taken the case up. They've not talked about it. They've not dealt with it. And I would submit to you, they're not going to. Uh, she will retire as bishop before they ever get around to dealing with her case that's been handed back to them from the Judicial Council. Now, this is outright disobedience to the Book of Discipline. Uh, regardless of whether one agrees uh, with her election or disagrees with it, that is, from an ideological point of view, if you're progressive and you agree, agree that uh, we should be electing open practicing homosexuals, still, the Book of Discipline currently says she shouldn't have been eligible. She shouldn't have been elected. This is a violation of the Book of Discipline. We're just disobeying church teaching. Uh, this is a major problem in the United Methodist Church. That we have a bishop of the United Methodist Church who's in violation to church teaching and established church law. And it sends a signal throughout the entire United Methodist Church that frankly, the Book of Discipline isn't binding and authoritative, that you don't have to obey it, that if bishops decide to disobey and defy the Book of Discipline, they can apparently get away with it. Well, now that led to a lot of other bishops deciding, okay, they can defy and disobey the Book of Discipline too. So when we got to 2019 and the traditional plan passed, uh, and the Book of Discipline reaffirmed the traditional teaching on marriage and human sexuality, a number of bishops and annual conference leaders immediately came out and said, we're not going to do that. We're not going to enforce those rules. In fact, many of them came out and said, we're going to do something opposite of that. We're going to defy the Book of Discipline and set in place a whole different set of rules contrary to what the Book of Discipline teaches. And it wasn't just the places you'd expect, like the Western jurisdiction, you know, where Bishop Olivetto is from. We might expect that the Western jurisdiction, that they would defy the Book of Discipline and that they would continue to go in a different direction. Or we might expect that some of the bishops in the Northeast, that they would defy the Book of Discipline and ordain open, practicing, self-avowed homosexuals and that they would uh, open up their churches uh, for same-sex weddings. We might expect the Northeast and the Western Coast to go that direction. However, it wasn't just those areas. It was even places in the Midwest. So, for instance, I give you the Iowa Annual Conference. Now, this is drawn uh, from one of the pages on the Iowa Annual Conference's website. Uh, unless they've pulled it down, you can go and find it there. Uh, this is the Iowa Annual Conference's appointed cabinet. Uh, now, the point of cabinet is the bishop of their annual conference, and every district superintendent and all the other conference staff who are involved in making appointments, that is, appointing pastors to churches. These are the people who decide what pastor your church will get in the Iowa Annual Conference. They decided we're not going to follow the traditional plan. That is currently the, the Book of Discipline says, uh, but we're not going to do that. Instead, we're going to implement the one church plan, the plan that didn't pass, the plan that General Conference soundly rejected and set aside. They decided they're going to put it in place. Now, remember, the one church plan said uh, that each bishop and annual conference leadership would get to decide whether they uh, would ordain open, self-avowed, practicing homosexuals or not. Uh, and the Iowa bishop said, we're going to ordain them. Uh, and then here in this policy, they make it clear each pastor and each church will get to decide whether they preside over or host same-sex weddings. Note the part I've got highlighted. This is their written policy. To put it clearly, pastors will be able to choose which weddings they officiate as long as it's two consenting adults who've been counseled. Now, now note that. Not a man and a woman who've been counseled, but just two consenting adults, two men, two women, uh, however it works, as long as they've been counseled, 
pastors can choose to officiate those weddings. Likewise, church leadership, in consultation with their pastors, will be able to determine their own policy regarding weddings. That means that those churches will be able to decide whether they host same-sex weddings or not. Now you'll note what comes right before that. No one will be prevented from doing the ministry God is calling them to offer. In essence, each one will get to decide what they want to do. Each church and each pastor will get to decide what's right in their own eyes. In essence, they're implementing the one church plan. Or to put it a different way, they're implementing a version of the book of Judges. If you recall how the book of Judges ends, Judges chapter 21, verse 25, the last verse of the book of Judges. The Bible says, And in those days there was no king in Israel, and each one did what was right in his own eyes. Friends, that's what the Iowa Annual Conference just said is their policy. You get to decide what's right and wrong in your eyes. Each pastor gets to decide whether it's right or wrong for officiating a same-sex wedding. Are you comfortable with it or not? You decide. Each church leadership gets to decide whether they're comfortable with hosting a same-sex wedding. You decide whether it's right or wrong in your church. In our annual conference, we'll decide whether it's right or wrong to ordain open practicing homosexuals, and we've decided it's right, so we're going to do it. They've implemented the each one will do what's right in their own eyes plan, the one church plan, which is a vision for having a big tent to keep traditionalists, centrists, and progressives all in one church together. Now I point this out because this is the Midwest. This isn't the very liberal West Coast. We might expect it there. Nor is this the kind of more liberal Northeast. We might expect it there too. This is the Midwest. This is the heartland of the country. Uh, this is not automatically our liberal and progressive area. But I want to tell you, this is just one example. I could give you annual conference after annual conference. You can go and look. It's not just Iowa. It's others in the Midwest. Indiana, Illinois, and the list goes on. Even in the southeastern jurisdiction, our jurisdiction, there are annual conferences that are implementing this version of the One Church Plan. So, for instance, you get, well, North Georgia, as best I can tell, best on what their bishop has said, uh, and some of the materials their conference is putting out and things I'm hearing from pastors closer to that conference, they've basically implemented the One Church Plan in North Georgia. Uh, I take my pastor friends at their word that that's what's happening in North Georgia. Uh, and likewise, the Florida Annual Conference is very much along those lines, which really has led to a different thing that's happening down there. Our Florida Annual Conference is to the south of us, I had a really big controversy happen during their annual conference meeting this past June. Uh, during their clergy session, that's the clergy-only meeting uh, where clergy do things like deciding who's going to get ordained this year and who's not. Every pastor who gets ordained is voted on uh, at that meeting at annual conference by your fellow clergy, uh, deciding whether you're ready to go on to ordination. As part of that, one of the steps to ordination, really your last big step, uh, is to get commissioned as a provisional elder or deacon. It's a big deal. I remember when I was commissioned as a provisional elder. It's a huge step. Usually you get commissioned as a provisional elder, and then you go three or so years. The Board of Ordained Ministry that oversees ordination matters reviews you one last time, and then if that clergy session votes to approve you, uh, they ordain you that annual conference. So that getting commissioned as a provisional elder or deacon, that's like you're three years away from getting fully ordained as an elder or deacon. It's a big step. They had 16 candidates that were to be voted on to be commissioned for being provisional elder or deacon. 16 candidates. Unfortunately, there was a problem that cropped up. One of the traditionalist leaders in the Florida Annual Conference picked up, before Annual Conference happened, uh, that 
The Board of Ordained Ministries candidates they'd interviewed, those 16 candidates included at least two, maybe three, but at least two verified, two candidates that were self-avowed, open, practicing homosexual. It was an open secret within the annual conference, and the Board of Ordained Ministry had approved them to be commissioned as provisional elders, the last big step before you eventually get ordained as a full elder or deacon. Well, now that's a problem. So look, the traditionalist leader, he doesn't want to embarrass anybody. He doesn't want there to be a scandal. So he goes privately to the chair of Board of Ordained Ministry and says, is there a way we can handle this? Because technically they shouldn't be eligible and traditionalists aren't going to be able to vote for that. Uh, the outcome of that conversation was, I think, politely being told, uh, no, we're going to go forward with that. We have the bishop's support. The traditionalist leaders appealed that a couple of different times to the Board of Ordained Ministry Chair. They were told no each time we're going forward. They appealed it to the bishop privately. The bishop told them no, we're going forward with this. They're properly before the annual conference. They're going to get voted on. When they got to the clergy meeting at annual conference, the traditionalist leaders got up and they said, we asked to vote for each of these candidates individually. Now understand, in many annual conferences, like Florida, so also it's our custom in Mississippi, we usually do block voting on our candidates like this. They all come as one big group, and you vote them all up, or you vote them all down. It's kind of a nervous thing when you're a candidate, you hope they vote us up. Usually it's unanimous, they vote everybody up. Well, in this case it wasn't unanimous. The traditionalist leaders said, we've got a problem, Brewery. Can we vote for them individually so that the 14 candidates that are eligible to be commissioned, we can elect them and put them in to be commissioned as provisional elder or deacon, and then these two will unfortunately have to turn down. The bishop said no. We vote for them as a group, or we don't vote for them as all. That's the rule. And he refused to bend on it. Now understand, it's not an official rule. It's just a custom. The bishop could have done the thing of voting for them individually. It would have saved a lot of problems. But the bishop chose not to do so. Uh, and as a result, they had to vote for them as a block group. Uh, and in the end, it didn't happen. You needed 75%, three quarters of all the voting delegates of the pastors present to elect them to be commissioned as provisional elder or deacon. You needed 75%. The first time they voted, they only got 70%. A few traditionalists left early to go to lunch, so they voted again. Politics. That time, they only got 72%. They never got the 75%. 28% of the delegates voted no. Because in good conscience, there were two of the delegates that were really in violation of the Book of Discipline. You can't in good conscience vote for someone who shouldn't be voted to be ordained an elder. Uh, and they shouldn't be commissioned to be an elder or deacon. Uh, this is a problem. So they voted no based on their conscience and based on what the Book of Discipline says, by the way. It's in contradiction to the Book of Discipline for them to be commissioned. Well, now that made the bishop upset and he said some things that were rather unfortunate, I think. And look, I don't want to speak ill of the bishop. I'm sure he meant, well, he felt sincerely that uh, it was a scandal in his mind that 14 candidates who could have been commissioned didn't get commissioned because of two. And there were those that thought that mean and spiteful. How would you hold back 14 eligible candidates just because you don't think two should have been eligible? But really, I take the other side of that argument. I want to ask, why are we pushing to get two candidates through using the weight of 14 who should be elected to get through the two who shouldn't have been. And not the real problem. The bishop had worked with Board of Ordain Ministry to set this up. He created this conflict. He knowingly orchestrated this controversy. He knew that there were two candidates who shouldn't have been eligible, that were in violation of the Book of Discipline. But he pushed them forward anyway because he wanted to push them through. He wanted to create a fully inclusive United Methodist Church. Now that's Florida. 
That's our southeastern jurisdiction. That's a bishop in an annual conference right near Mississippi. Uh, no offense, that could be our bishop the next time around. He's eligible to be relocated, I hear. Uh, so January 1st, we could have the old Florida bishop as our new Mississippi bishop. Will he push to do that here? Well, you start to see the problem. We have this growing trend of disobeying the Book of Discipline. In fact, one of our United Methodist bishops has been honest enough to point that out. Bishop Scott Jones. He is currently the bishop of the Texas Annual Conference. Uh, that's the Houston area of Texas. Texas has like five annual conferences. The state is so big. But Bishop Scott Jones, who's actually a centrist bishop by and large, but he leans strongly traditional in the sense that he enforces the Book of Discipline in his conference. He's also retiring at the end of this calendar year. Uh, so uh, he's leaving the uh, active ministry as a bishop. But Bishop Scott Jones said just a few weeks ago, and I quote, In other words, the quantity of disobedience is spreading and increasing as bishops and boards of ordained ministry and conferences choose to do it. So that even if the general conference doesn't vote to be more progressive, the church will become more progressive simply because people who are supposed to enforce the rules choose not to do so. Now, know that last part. That last part is really important. Because the disobedience is increasing so much, even if the general conference doesn't vote to be more progressive, the church will become more progressive simply because people who are supposed to enforce the rules choose not to do so. In essence, what he's saying is this. If our bishops are disobeying the Book of Discipline, and we have no way of holding them accountable, because in practice, we have no real way of holding them accountable, there are things in the Book of Discipline for how to hold a bishop accountable. They don't work, because it counts on other bishops helping to do that process of holding bishops accountable. And it counts on episcopacy committees and annual conferences and jurisdictions that have been mostly appointed by bishops to hold those bishops accountable. In essence, if you listen closely and you watch carefully, you can see a good old boy system here. Uh, I'll protect you if you protect me. I won't bring charges against you if you don't bring charges against me. Our bishops have been protecting one another. And so our accountability measures don't work. You know, I've never in my years of ministry, and I'm a pastor's kid, I go back to as a kid watching this, I can't remember ever seeing a bishop of the United Methodist Church ever being held accountable for violating the Book of Discipline. If it came to matters of money or something really egregious in a different way, maybe. But I don't know that I've ever seen a bishop disciplined in any meaningful way according to our Book of Discipline. It just doesn't happen. So the bishops are defying and disobeying the Book of Discipline. There's no accountability. And as Bishop Jones was gracious enough and transparent enough to point out, it ceases to matter then what we pass at General Conference, which is really what the traditionalists have concluded. Why are the traditionalists the ones leaving? Well, because, friends, what many of our traditional leaders have observed, you know, I one I'll point to, and he's well worth going and reading his materials, and he's got some great videos to listen to. Rob Renfro, uh, he's the president of Good News. Now, I know some of our progressive and centrist friends will do an eye roll at that point. They don't like Rob Renfro. I really highly value and respect him. His advice is usually very well taken. But he's one of those voices on the traditional side who's come out and point, why are we as traditionalists even thinking about leaving? Well, the reason is because it doesn't matter what we pass at General Conference. We've gone to General Conference every four years for the last 50 years and reaffirmed the traditional teaching of the Church. And yet at every point, the progressives and the centrists have moved in a different direction. And despite what the Book of Discipline actually says, they have decided to pick and choose the parts they'll keep. 
that if they like the things that it says, they enforce that. Uh, so for instance, I'll point out, with the disaffiliation paragraph, they really like what it says about two years apportionment, and they love what it says about the unfunded pension liability. They like that part. They want to enforce that. They like that they can add as much extra expense to that as they want, uh, that the Book of Disemployment allows them to ask for as much extra financially beyond that. Uh, Senate annual conferences are really taking that to heart. They will hold your feet to the fire over the trust clause. We like the trust clause. We're enforcing that. But the ordaining of practicing homosexuals, we don't like that it forbids that. So we're going to do something else and we'll ordain self-avowed practicing homosexual because we've decided to do something different. They're picking and choosing the rules. There's nothing we can do to stop them. There's no accountability. And so what many of the traditionalist leaders have observed is, well, what does it matter then if we go to the next general conference in 2024 and we reaffirm if we were to fight really hard and to win the vote by even a slim margin and reaffirm yet again the traditional teaching of the church on marriage and human sexuality and the practice of homosexuality. That is that marriage really is between one man and one woman to the exclusion of all other relationships. And that as a result, the practice of homosexuality really is incompatible with Christian teaching. And so we can't ordain self about practicing homosexuals. It would be against what the Bible teaches. Even if we were to go to the 2024 General Conference and reaffirm that yet again, what difference would it make? Bishops would just ignore it. They'd set other policies in its place. They would either put in place a one-church plan where each church and each pastor get to decide what's right in their own eyes, or they would just make their annual conference a fully inclusive, LGBTQ-friendly conference. And there's nothing we can do to stop them. It's really ceased to matter what the Book of Discipline says. We can put the rules in print, but what good does it do to pass rules and legislation, even matters of accountability, if nobody follows the rules, or if they're selectively enforced based on what bishops feel like enforcing. That's a problem, isn't it? What do you do? So what many traditionalist leaders, and truthfully many traditionalist pastors and congregations are concluding is, it's not worth the fight. Why, why fight that fight? In essence, in a way, we won the battle, but we lost the war. Now I want you to hear that. We went to every general conference for the last 50 years, and we won the battle. But in the overall, we've lost the war. The war to keep the United Methodist Church traditional, and even, dare I say, biblical, has been lost. We lost that fight. Every observable fact is telling us that. It's sad, it's unfortunate, but that's clearly the direction the United Methodist Church is going. The question is simply, how long will it take to get there? Right now, what our centrist and progressive leaders are painting is that we're going to be a big church, a big tent, that every group will be welcome, every perspective will be on, that there's going to be room for traditionalists and centrists and progressives. And it's going to be like the one church plan. Uh, you'll get to decide what's right for your church, your congregation, for you as a pastor. And there'll be room for all of us within this big tent of the United Methodist Church. That's the promise. And I promise there'll always be room for you. So what's the rush? Why leave? Now, that would be a valid thing to consider, I guess, if it weren't for a couple things. On the one hand, from a traditionalist point of view, Truth isn't contextual. Truth isn't subjective. If the Bible says something is right, then it's eternally and absolutely right. If the Bible says something is wrong, well then it's eternally and absolutely wrong. There's never an instance in which it becomes right. So how can you live in a denomination where this group says it's right and that group says it's wrong and if I go to this church 
they're going to do these things, but if I go to that church, they're not going to do these things. That doesn't make any sense. But even more, the deeper problem it creates is, how long will that last? I mean, for right now, there's a big tent. And all perspectives will have room and be on. There'll be room for you, they promise. But how long does that promise hold? You know, as more traditionalists leave, the votes at General Conference diminish. You know, at the 2019 General Conference, the traditional plan passed by a mere 54 votes. Let me repeat that. That's not 54%. That's 54 total votes. That was the majority. That was the margin of difference. That's a slim margin. But look, it passed. It was estimated that had we had the 2020 General Conference, that would have been a 20-vote margin. That's an even slimmer margin. Now, that's accounting for usually there are 30 or 40 delegates from Africa who have visa problems getting into the United States. That's every time uh, that was accounted for in the formula. It was estimated that there'd be a slim 20-volt margin. But hey, that would have been enough to carry the day. Friends, I don't think we have those 20 votes. I keep watching, and I can't keep the strict count, but I see traditionalist leader and traditionalist congregation after congregation and pastor leaving, some of whom include delegates to General Conference. How many delegates to General Conference have already disaffiliated from the United Methodist Church? I suspect it's been more than 20. That means there's a very real possibility that we could get to the 2024 General Conference. Not only does it not reaffirm the traditional teaching of the Church, but it actually changes our definition of marriage. Now, I want to be clear, it's not going to change our understanding of uh, a number of other things like uh, is, you know, uh, about Jesus and God and the Bible. That all those are in the doctrine section. That can't be changed. Not easily, at least. But our definition of marriage, is marriage between one man and one woman? Or is it just between two consenting adults of whatever gender? There's a real possibility that could be changed at the 2024 General Conference. And if and when that's changed, how long until it's no longer optional? You know, there's a rule I learned a long time ago. I give him a lot of credit. His name is uh, Richard uh, John Newhouse, Father Richard John Newhouse. He was a former Lutheran priest. He was a part of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America uh, throughout the 80s and 90s when they were going through all of this in their denomination. He realized what direction the Lutherans were going and that he couldn't live with it as a traditionalist, and he exited. Now, his solution to that was uh, he became Roman Catholic. That his, that's his choice. That's not everybody's choice. Uh, it's not my choice. But he became Roman Catholic, which is why he's Father Richard John Newhouse. He's passed away since. He dubbed this Newhouse Law. I have found this an extraordinarily uh, powerful observation on his part. It's very true. This was his observation learned from hard experience in the Lutheran Church. Wherever orthodoxy is optional, orthodoxy will sooner or later be proscribed. Now, that's an old-fashioned, uh, highly literary way of saying uh, prohibited. Prescribed is a word for prohibited, forbidden, uh, even outlawed. So hear it again. Wherever orthodoxy is optional, orthodoxy will sooner or later be proscribed. Friends, I think that's the truth. As long as the biblical teaching is optional, well, some of you can hold to it, others of you don't have to. It's optional for a time. But how long does that last? You know, the Episcopal Church went down this path before us, they said that it'll be optional too. Big tent. That didn't even last 10 years. I forget how many years it lasted before they came for their last traditional bishop. Just not that long ago. And they told him, you need to do uh, ordination of practicing homosexuals in your diocese. And you need to allow every church and pastor to do same-sex weddings in your diocese or else. In good conscience, he objected. They made him resign his credentials. He had to leave the Episcopal Church 
just to be true to what the Bible teaches. Wherever orthodoxy is optional, it will sooner or later be prohibited. It's no longer optional in the Episcopal Church. It's no longer optional in the Presbyterian USA. It's not optional in the Evangelical Lutheran Church. There are any number of denominations where it was optional, but it's not now. I think our traditional leaders are right. It's currently going to be optional in the United Methodist Church. How long until it's not optional? Is it five years? Is it eight years? Do we have a full ten years? Well, friends, is it only three years? Because we've got a general conference coming up. How long until optional is taken away and it's now mandatory? You have to do these things because it's now what the Book of Discipline says or it's simply what your bishop has declared. Traditionalist leaders are recognizing that optional isn't going to last long. And so they decided, why stay and fight? Why fight a losing battle they can't win? And in fact, why put all that time and energy and money and truthfully heartache into fighting to try to win a battle you can't win? To make everybody miserable for another, what, five years? Only to arrive at the same outcome and conclusion we were already headed to. Why not leave and take your time and talents, your energy and your resources, and go start something new? And so that's what they've decided to do. That's what the Global Methodist Church is that they're starting. That was the traditionalist denomination that was envisioned as part of the protocol, which, by the way, will probably never pass. Every group except the traditionalists has withdrawn their support for the protocol. Even Bishop Scott Jones has said the protocol is dead. It's not going to pass. Uh, there's no hope for it at this point. Uh, there are people saying there's hope, but I don't see any hope of it passing for a variety of reasons. But the traditional uh, church that was supposed to come out of that was to be named later. It launched May 1st. It's the Global Methodist Church. The majority of those traditionalist leaders and many of the traditional congregations and pastors that are leaving the United Methodist Church, that's what they believe in to do. Why are they leaving? They're taking their time and their energy, their resources and their talents to go and establish something new. Where you don't have to fight over whether we keep what the Bible says, whether what the Bible says is true or not. We simply all agree it's true. And we go and be what the United Methodist Church always promised it would be, what the Book of Discipline says we should be, to in essence go be faithful United Methodists in a different denomination, and to pursue where God is leading us and to be faithful there, to start something new, and invest our resources in that, and to build something for the kingdom there. And so if the continuing United Methodist Church wants to become more progressive, and to try to reach people that way, well, bless them. Maybe they'll succeed in that. I'm skeptical about that. But maybe they will. But the traditionalists that are leaving are going, they're leaving to start something new, uh, to be able to be faithful to the Bible, uh, to be able to live out their convictions and their conscience, and to be able to reach people for Jesus by how we understand the Bible. That's why traditionalists are leaving. Uh, that's not an easy thing to accept. I'm going to tell you, I'm a second generation United Methodist pastor. It breaks my heart that this is where the United Methodist Church is. I can't tell you how many sleepless nights I've had. I grieve over this, that our United Methodist Church is breaking apart. And friends, there are no winners. There are only losers. This isn't how it should have been. I prayed so hard for the protocol. I hoped so deeply that it would pass that there would be an amicable way of in a gracious, kindly, dare I say Christian way of separating the United Methodist Church. Almost like Paul and Barnabas in Acts chapter 15. They disagreed over how to go about ministry. and In the end, Paul went his way, and Barnabas went the other way, and they blessed each other to go. I wish that had happened. Oh, I wish it had. This isn't a good witness to anyone what's going on right now. And regardless of what 
our individual congregation decides. There are no winners in the United Methodist Church. I grieve over what's happened. But I also know the choice before every traditionalist church and every traditionalist pastor is, what does the Bible say? And what do we believe? And what do we need to be do? What do we need to do to be faithful to Jesus? That's the choice that lies before us. This is why the United Methodist Church is breaking apart. This is why the traditionalists are the ones who are leaving. May we each prayerfully discern where God is leading us. Well, anyway, I hope you found this helpful. If you have, I encourage you, as always, hit the like button down below. Uh, it helps make this more visible. If you found it very helpful, I invite you to share it with a friend. Um, if you've got questions or comments, I would invite you to leave those in the comments section down below. Uh, you're not leaving questions or comments much these days, but if you have them, I'll do my best to get back to you with them. Uh, if you disagree with something I've said, I'd encourage you to put that there as well. Uh, I'm open to good-hearted disagreement about these things. Uh, we have room for having that conversation. Until next time, uh, I hope that uh, you have a wonderful day, and God bless you.